Right now, there seems to be a huge shift that's happening. I've seen a lot of options traders transitioning to futures. We're seeing a lot of the prop firm traders now transitioning to futures. Mm. What are your thoughts in terms of why futures? Like, why do you trade futures? When I first found futures, I was like, this is exactly what I was looking for in trading. Welcome everyone back to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We're back once again. We're still here in Miami. We switched things up a little bit. Um, well, it depends when this comes out. So maybe we'll switch it back. I don't know which way it goes. But yeah, thank you as always for tuning in to the Words of Wisdom podcast, the number one podcast in the trading space and the fastest growing thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. Talking of which, we have a podcast exclusive today. A podcast first. We have the man himself, Fair Value God, aka Zach. Oh, yeah. I didn't check beforehand. I managed no, to Zach's remember. Smooth, yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad. How, how are you, man? Good, man. First time in Miami, meeting you, seeing some cool other people, and just happy to be here. Definitely. Well, no, yeah. it's our pleasure to have you with us, and, and thank you for traveling over as well for the pod. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, how are you finding Miami so far? Dude, it's awesome. It's definitely got that hustler's mentality. And I met some cool people last night when I went out to eat. I've only been here for a full day, and uh, I've already been to like Wynwood, some other spots, and it's a good spot. You're going to move now already. I thought about, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. It's, uh, there's definitely a lot of distractions, but mm -hmm. I think if you can say no to certain things and focus on getting your work and play at the same time, I think I can make, I can manage it. I think. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. Well, man, fair value God. I, oh, the yeah. first time I heard that name, I loved it. I was like, this is incredible. Yeah. Um, you want to break like, it down for us? Yeah. You're probably like the ego on that guy is probably no, insane. No. <laughs> no, no, no. The funny thing is actually, I heard it on a, a space, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. I was on a, one of Kit's spaces. Yeah. Um, and that's where I saw the name. So let's say if I just saw the name, then I'd probably think that maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I remember you were talking, that's how I first saw you. And uh, you know, you're seeing very balanced stuff, very valuable stuff. So mm -hmm. I kind of already knew it was like, probably just a play on the words. Yeah, um, exactly, yeah. But yeah, like where did, it, where did it come from? What was the inspiration? You know, it was honestly, like you said, a play on words in the beginning. And it was really just a joke at the time. It was like right when I discovered ICT, the way I trade using his concepts and it's the play on words, right? Just something kind of funny, but it also was kind of like an alter ego thing, mm -hmm. right? Where, all right, I can't be the fair value God and be shit at trading, right? So I kind of use that as like motivation, but also as something like an alter ego where I can kind of step into that like character almost. Not that I'm playing a character, but kind of just have that as my like North star, right? Mm -hmm. and like who is the fair value God. And so it allowed me to kind of identify the person that I wanted to be as a trader and then follow that path to get there. So it was almost like a, a play on words, like you said, and it kind of captures your attention, but it was more of like an alter ego kind of thing. No, well, I actually really like that actually. Cause yeah. so it was like, essentially who does that trader need to be? Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's that character if you are the avatar. Yeah. And then you're trying to embody that avatar. Right? Exactly. I have a little experience with uh, alter egos now with Riz Burgundy. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I asked you, I was like, am I getting interviewed by Riz Burgundy or Riz Iqbal? I just pull out some, some, <laughs> some, some, some sunglasses. Yeah, it's going to come out in the middle of this meeting. Can you imagine? Yeah. <laughs> That's the funny thing though. I'm getting, I understand it more now. Like you play this character, mm -hmm. right? But it's interesting how you did that for your trading though. I yeah. mean, as a, I've always said to people in terms of trading wise, like if you just envision the, the trader, like when you see yourself as a profitable trader, what does that look like? Yeah. Does it look like you're, you know, is that person disciplined? Are they patient? What does the office space around them look like? Mm. Are they in an the office? Maybe they're in on a beach. You know, what, what does that look like to you as an individual? And then just replicate that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I like just do that now. Yeah. Because if you see that as that's, that's what that person does, why aren't you doing it now then? Does that make sense? Yeah. Their habits, you know, what are they even, even to down like what they do each morning, like making your bed, stacking mm -hmm. those small wins, mm -hmm. those victories, like they carry over into your trading. Like you can't, you can't neglect the small things. Exactly. No, yeah. exactly. And you know, I think that's a very interesting way. I think more people should probably do it. You're mm -hmm. going to start seeing new pseudo names, if you will. And yeah. I think a lot of up. people have like some screen names and stuff that they step into. And I'll be honest, uh, that was like a, I want to see a phase I've gone through now and I'm kind of trying to do something different where I'm not going to change my name or anything, but I kind of want to be known for as a person now and like a trader who I am. And, um, so like my goal for 2024 was to network and kind of put myself out there with my face, mm -hmm. you know, no more real hiding or not that I'm hiding, but using that avatar anymore. I think yeah. here soon I'll probably step away from that and kind of move on to the next evolution of like, who is fair value God, who is Zach Smith 
and you know use that as um, you know a networking tool. Definitely, so, no, hundred yeah. percent. And well, you've already started off with a, a yeah. good start, right? February already, so early in the year, mm. and you're here in Miami. You're already meeting people, which is incredible. And I think how important is it to do you think to network? Even as a trader, obviously trading is very solo game. Mm -hmm. But how has it helped already? Just in the the small amount that you've been doing already. I think trading can be really lonely at times. Um, not just because you know you're in, you're there by yourself it's a solo sport so to speak but also like if you don't have support from friends and family then you're pretty much on your own and no one's going to push the buttons for you no one's going to make you get up every morning and be disciplined it's it's a solo thing so i think that's another reason why people find these communities online and they find a lot of value in that in the camaraderie um, so networking for me is all about that like finding people who have the same interests, the same goals, same drive, and we've all been through the same struggles. So that's what networking means to me, and that's a, another reason why in 2024, I'm making that a priority, right? Definitely, no, definitely. And let's take it back a little bit in terms of your, your journey. I know you trade futures now, mm -hmm. right? But we were talking that you used to trade options before that? Yeah, yeah, I think everyone kind of started in the same spot, at least where I did. You know, you got Robin Hood on your phone and you're trading options, right? You get the PDT, pattern day trading rule, and. Um, I started out trading options and small caps and kind of just messing around and, you know, lost my ass in the beginning. But it was, it was more of a hobby in college, right? And I think that's what it happens for a lot of people is they kind of just get into it. They see some ads online or whatever it is, and they take interest. And then the gambler takes over and you say, oh, I can make money like that, right? But you get that beginner's luck. And then you get humbled real quick. And so that's what happened to me. And, you know, here I am now, four years later, trading futures. And I never thought, I didn't even know what futures were, mm -hmm. right? You kind of just have to go through the, this, the process of figuring out what you want to do, what kind of trader you want to be. And like I said, forming that alter ego or kind of getting that vision in your head of who do I want to be? What does he do? What does he trade? What is his lifestyle like? And then working backwards from there. I was very lucky to have... Um, this thing called in my family we do a thing called walk to manhood and it's a big surprise right i was i'm the oldest in my family so i have a younger brother and we would go for smoothies right me and my dad would walk up to the local smoothie place from my house and next thing you know my uncle's standing on the corner of the street by the shop i'm like what the hell what is that and he'd be like he's here to talk to you and so basically what it was is all these influential people from my not my life like my coach in high school my uncle um, some other people, family, friends, they were all scattered around the park in the city near my hometown or in my hometown. And we would go and, you know, each person would have a different topic. And so one of the topics that one of those people um, would, sit, would talk about with me on our walk was uh, figuring out like what you want to do, right? Getting that vision in your head and then working backwards to identify like the steps you need to take to get there. And so I think that was like the biggest thing that helped me realize that I don't want to do the traditional route of what all my friends were doing or even like what my parents were probably trying to get me to do early on. And I want to do something different. And so that was like the biggest thing for me was identifying what I wanted to do, the person I want to become, and then like formulating a plan to get there step mm -hmm. by step. What were those steps for you? Mm -hmm. I think honestly it was... At first, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and my, where I was in my journey. I was about to go to college, and I actually, this is actually the watch I got from the, the Walk to Manhood. Mm -hmm. um, nothing fancy, right? Just a citizen. But it's engraved on the back, and it's got the date of the walk and everything. So um, we went to, let's see, I was on the way to college, and I realized that I didn't want to do what everyone else was doing. And for, in Greenville, South Carolina, most people, they either go to Clemson University or the University of South Carolina. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna do something completely different. I'm gonna go either, I applied to Georgia, I applied to University of Colorado, um, I looked at University of Florida, just to kind of do something completely different. I ended up going to Colorado, loving it so much in Boulder, above Denver, and I like to ski. So I did that and you know, it was just the best experience because it forces you to get out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. and be comfortable really early on, like you have to make friends, otherwise you're gonna be like on your own, right? So it forces you to get out of your comfort zone. And I kind of made a video on this on YouTube uh, a couple of days ago where I talked about how you can use the power of discomfort, being comfortable or being at peace in that discomfort 
just how you're in a trade and you don't know the outcome, it's the same thing, right? You can use that power of discomfort to really be comfortable and at peace in uncertain situations. So I think going out to Colorado was like one of the biggest um, life hacks early on, like just moving out of your hometown, right? So if you're like 18, if you're wondering what to do or you're 16, you don't know what to do with your life, I would suggest moving out of your hometown and just putting yourself out there and talking to as many people as possible because you really don't know what else is out there mm -hmm. if you don't go and explore it for yourself. It's so true and it's really interesting because I never actually got the opportunity to travel by myself. But I remember a close friend of mine did and that's exactly what he used to uh, share with me is like it just forces you to become who you're meant to be in the sense or yeah, hopefully that's what it's meant to do. Some mm -hmm. people obviously might try it and then not really push themselves out of their comfort zone and therefore it doesn't really work out that way. But for a lot of people who do travel on their own, because we don't want to be alone, it forces us to then want to communicate, forces us mm -hmm. to kind of just accept that uncomfortable feeling that you're in this new environment and you're gonna have to take some risks of uh, mm. trying to make new friends and uh, convince that person that you know you, they want to be friends with you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I missed out on that personally, but I did travel a lot. So I didn't do it solo, but I traveled a lot. And even that alone, like just being in different environments, you know, being around different cultures and, and trying to converse with new people and different people and m even just trying to navigate, you know, mm -hmm. in these new environments, I like just learn where to go, the directions, even here in Miami, for example, yeah. trying to work out what the different areas are, et cetera. Mm -hmm. All this sort of stuff does present growth. But I think the biggest analogy you gave there was, was obviously getting comfortable in being discomfort as a trader mm -hmm. is so powerful. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's something that is so, so important because at the end of the day, as a trader, we're so always uncomfortable. And that's something that I don't think that ever changes. I think your level of tolerance and level of being okay with the fact that you're uncomfortable just rises over time. Uh, what was that like for you, that process of learning to be more comfortable as a trader? Mm -hmm. You really have to, I kind of accepted that you have to live in the gray, right? It's not black and white. And you really have to be comfortable living in the gray every single day because it can be stressful. But the longer you do it, the more comfortable you get because you find ways to kind of cope with the anxiety, working out in the gym is one of the things that I do each, you know, each week that really gets that stress out of your mind, right? It helps you clear your head. So just like your habits outside of the charts are gonna carry themselves into the charts. So if you're disciplined outside the market, it's gonna carry itself over into the market, right? Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was, it was a process for sure. When you're 18 and you go halfway across the country and you don't know a single soul, right? It, it can be daunting. But I think the fact that if you can, if you can find friends and you can go out and actually succeed in an environment like that, then you, that's just a, a victory in itself, right? And so, you know, it's, it's always baby steps. You can do something like that. Well, then I can probably succeed at these other things too. So that, I think that process was, was largely influential in my development early on as not just like a young man, but and becoming a trader too. A hundred percent. Would you say they go hand in hand though? Like a lot of the time to be a efficient person and a high value person in, mm -hmm. in a way and a successful person, th those traits is what then allows you to be a successful trader or successful in entrepreneurship or whatever else it may be. Let's take a break for a minute there guys because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, trade replay, in-depth analytics, and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZella is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks, you can just add notes, you can add images from your trades, and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZella is for absolutely everyone. Whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. And let's get back to the episode. I would say so, yeah, I would say so. And like one of the things that I, I knew I could make trading work was, and this is kind of getting back to like kind of my story, 
after about a year and a half at Colorado and in, in university, I was going to school for biochemistry. And so I wanted to be a dentist. And that was my goal, right? Because I like the idea of owning my own practice and kind of having a business. I was kind of entrepreneurial minded um, from an early age. And so I knew I wanted to do something kind of different than most people. And so working with people in the dental, in the dental office and having employees and having a business and maybe some freedom and making, making money, you know, that was something that was attractive to me. But after about a year and a half, I realized, you know, I need, either need to make a change because my grades weren't that good. And I was like, if I'm going to take this serious, I got to make a change. I was partying, I joined a fraternity, all that stuff. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to transfer back home to the University of South Carolina where I had friends from high school and people already knew there. I'm going to transfer back home, save some money, and also focus up and be closer to home, less distractions. And I kind of just focused up and applied to dental school and ended up moving down to Charleston, South Carolina, where I currently live, to be closer to the dental school and really show that I was serious. Ended up, long story short, applied during peak COVID 2020, got an interview, didn't get in that year. And most people have to apply maybe two or three times to get in, right? But here I was straight out of college and didn't get in, so I didn't really know what to do. But throughout that whole process, right, of applying, and I took the DAT, which is like the MCAT mm -hmm. for dental school, and I got an above average score. So like, I think the national average is a 17 and the average at MUSC where I was trying to go was a 19. And so I got a 21. So I knew, I knew, and I studied for that like the whole summer. So I knew if I could get a good score on that, I could do pretty much anything that I put my mind to. And so that was a big realization for me. Like that gave me a big confidence boost in itself, just getting a high score on that test, even though I didn't get into dental school, that, hey, if I put my mind to something, like, I can do it, right? So I think, like, stacking victories like that in your life, whether it's something as small as, small as like, making your bed every morning or passing a test like that that you studied your ass off for, I think stacking those and using those to your advantage is huge. 100%. And I think when you do that for yourself, it's very interesting you said that in terms of it was like a... Was it, do you think it was like proof of concept, proof that you can, if you put your mind to something that you can achieve it. And then from there, you've been able to use that mindset into other things in your life, such as trading, for example. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like, like I said, your habits outside the market, they're going to carry over into the market. So if you're a slob and you're not waking up at the same time every day, you don't have a routine because I trade full time and it's easy when you don't have a boss to slack off. Right. And I even found myself you know, beginning of this year, I made a change, um, which was, you know, I would get up and I would sit in my pajamas and I would just have my shoes off and I'd be trading at my desk right after breakfast and about like 8.30. And it was, I found myself like slacking off, right? And my mindset wasn't there. I, I, I heard this quote and it was like, you either fuck the day or the day fucks you, right? And so that was like a, a light bulb went off. I was like, I'm literally getting fucked by the day right now. I need to make a change. So now when I sit down, I put on some nice presentable clothes. I wear shoes. Like you might think it's stupid, but those small things, like I'm going to work that day. And so that's, that's those simple things like making your bed or fucking the day. Right. And just framing your mind like that. Those are the things that will carry over mm -hmm. into the market. So no, definitely. No, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Probably most people who sat there like, damn it, I'm getting, yeah. I'm getting fucked by the day right now. But, um, but yeah, no, I love that. And I think it is so important. And I think it's so interesting that it's the, it's the little things, you know, it's the, mm -hmm. it's the small details that most people are like cliche or they just kind of don't even think about it. They don't even try and think about it, but they make such a huge difference. Like that, like you said, it, it may sound silly, but it's not. I think it's so important that traders hear that because a lot of people who are trying to be full time or trying to trade, they're doing that. And not to say mm -hmm. that everyone has to do that, right? No, I've, so there are going to be the very few people who can trade from their bed, literally from their bed yeah. and do it fine very few but they can still do it like that's the beauty of trading in mm -hmm. terms of like you can do anything any style anywhere any age whatever like there's no limitations that's yeah. the beauty of it it's also the curse of it because then you could trick yourself into thinking ah oh, anyway you know, i can do it from here i can do it from there i can do it anytime in any way and mm -hmm. any mindset that's just not the reality is like if you look at what the majority are going to have to do, you need to have that routine, that structure, and treat it as a professional yeah. and uh, turn up as a professional, you know? Um, and yeah, I think like a lot of people take the example of, let's say, the, the one person who 
has no routine, no structure, and he does it fine. So mm. that means anyone can do it fine, you know? Or, or the enigma, as they say, like the, the, the unique individual, the one out of a thousand. Mm. Um, but I think it's so important to, to really do that, treat it like a profession and, and to turn up as a professional, you know? But in terms of right now, there seems to be a huge shift that's happening. And I've seen a lot of options traders transitioning to futures. We're seeing a lot of the prop firm traders now transitioning to futures. Mm. They're being forced into it by the looks of it. But what are your thoughts in terms of why futures? Like, why do you trade futures? God, I, I can't. When I first found futures, I was like, this is exactly what I was looking for in trading. Like, this was the, the idea that there's no Greeks that you have to mess with on the, fut- on the options contracts. Um, and I don't, I don't trade futures options, right? I just trade the straight up futures contracts. Uh, but the idea of, you know, no Greeks, no time decay, um, you don't have to mess with all that stuff. The fact that you can place hard stops at levels, right? And that way, if price chops sideways, you're not slowly losing money anyways, like you would on options with the time decay. But the fact that you can place hard stops, take profit levels, and really trade off the chart like I do was a game changer for me. Like when I found ICT, the fact that there was clear entry, exit, and stop loss placement um, criteria, that was like the game changer for me. That's what I had been looking for. Because otherwise, I was kind of just eyeballing the options ladder, right, with the prices of the contracts. And I would have to, if you place a hard stop, the volatility could stop you out, but price didn't actually go down to that level where your invalidation point was and stop you out. So that was like the biggest thing for me was I had finally found something or an instrument that had would give me like the the true essence of trading, placing your stops. It didn't feel like I was gambling really anymore with the Greeks and all that. It was, it just felt like true trading to me. Definitely. We, did you have any sort of profitability consistency on options before transitioning? Yeah, but not like I do with futures. Mm-hmm. Like not, I, 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 I found ICT kind of at the end of my options journey. And the whole reason I got into futures was because of ICT. Yeah. So I was trading mostly tech, right? Or whatever the theme was. I remember obviously COVID stocks were big. Um, you had mRNA, like, you know, all these Pfizer, mm-hmm. right? AMD, NVIDIA, Tesla. I was trading those and just spending hours of my time looking for setups because I was trading, you know, your technical analysis, your original TA that mm-hmm. most people are used to, bull flags, all that. Yeah. And I was using um, EMA clouds, right, to kind of find trends in the market. And so that was like switching from that and just kind of dumbing it down. With futures not having to worry about the contracts the expirations all that stuff and moving over to something that was just super simple just trading off the chart and dumbing it down was like the biggest switch for me it's interesting you say that because a lot of people would look at ict and be like that's the opposite of dumbing it down right yeah but then it's all perception based so that's someone's perception because it's so interesting that i come as you can imagine i come across so many traders Mm -hmm. and i see ict traders who simplify the methods and I see ICT traders who completely complex the methods yeah, yeah. to a point where I'm like, I'm sat there talking to them and my mind's just going crazy. Yeah. Um, but why ICT? Like, how did you come across ICT? Why ICT concepts? Why did they resonate mm. with you? I came across ICT. Uh, I had just moved back out of my parents' house. And this is at the time where I kind of d- had put dental school in the back burner. And I was basically trying to make trading a full-time thing. And I was finding a little bit of profitability with options enough to like pay rent and stuff like that, but nothing crazy, right? Not the Lambo lifestyle that you see online. You know, I'm 26 and I was paying my rent and I had the freedom to kind of do what I wanted to do, but I wasn't driving the Lambos or anything like that. But I think that's really what people are looking for anyways, is like they want the freedom. They don't, the money is just a byproduct of the skill. Mm -hmm. And so I had kind of found ICT when I had moved back down to Charleston, South Carolina, because I was down there for dental school. I moved back home with my parents for nine months, save money, kind of figure out what I, what it was I wanted to do. And I was just trading every day, like hours on the market, like nonstop from open to close, looking for setups at night, just giving it my all, trying to learn as much as I could. And that was during the options phase. Then I moved back down to Charleston with a roommate from college. And I remember like I set all my desk up, he hadn't moved in yet. So I took over his room, set everything up. And I log on this Discord room I'm in, and these people are talking about fair value gaps. And I was like, what's a fair value gap? And they're like, oh, dude, Price likes to go and draw towards them, and they, ba- they react off these levels. And I was like, really? Let me see this thing. So they sent me this indicator that painted like every single fair value gap mm-hmm. on your chart. 
And I was noticing, I was like, dude, the precision on this is like insane. After like looking at it and kind of studying and back testing it, I was like, this is, this is crazy. So I need to look into this more. And that's when someone referred me to his YouTube channel, Michael's YouTube channel. And I just started consuming every video I could, right? And I'd watch a video before bed and I was kind of still in my dental school studying habits. So I had like, I knew the times of the day that I was gonna best consume knowledge. And for me, studying before bed was like the biggest thing because when you actually learn or like just reading a book before bed, you actually retain the information better. So I was studying and watching videos before bed and I'd sleep on the information and then wake up. And it's funny, the next day I would literally see what I learned in the chart that day. Like that's what I love about trading is the market's open, at least in futures 24 seven almost. And you can really learn something and implement it immediately and get results. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I like trading so much, but you can also lose your ass immediately too. <laughs> so it's a, it's a double-edged sword for sure. But that's kind of how I found ICT. And like I said, it resonated so much with me be, was because just trading off the chart, not really trading news events or having to search for setups, just focusing on a few instruments like NASDAQ or maybe some gold or oil, whatever it is that you're trading and just kind of just limiting your approach to a certain few things that make sense with you. And that's kind of something that I want to talk about with you is like, I think the biggest problem that new traders have is trying to implement every single little thing they learn into their trading. And it's an endless loop because you can learn infinitely amount of information, right? But you can only implement so much before you go crazy and you get that analysis paralysis. So I think the biggest thing that I would recommend most people to do, especially if they're learning ICT, is to really find what, co what concepts, find what concepts resonate with you and your trading personality and the, the type of trader that you want to be. Because if you're not trading, you know, macro moves, why do you care about how to read macro, you know, price action or, you know, macro view of the market? Find things that will resonate with your personality and implement and be very strict with like what you implement into your own approach. Definitely. So like find you, what matches your personality, stick yeah. to that. Yeah. Don't worry about anyone else. Don't mm -hmm. look to overcomplicate or have layers that aren't necessary for you. Yeah. If you're always looking online and comparing like, oh, maybe someone made money that day, but I didn't. Mm -hmm well, then you're just going to feel like their strategy is superior because they're making money you're not. But really all it is is they've found what works for them. And so you need to go through that same process of identifying what concepts resonate with your personality. Um, and that's kind of how I pieced my strategy together. I was in that endless loop of information, right? And you kind of have to get past that point and consume that content to really find what works for you anyways. But once you kind of find these concepts, and the way I did it was, I would watch the info on his channel, but there's like, like 600 videos on there and they're all hours and hours long and you kind of have to sift through the info, right? Or you can kind of do what I did and I, I did that, right? But I would go online on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it. I would go online, I'd find traders that I liked or that resonated with uh, my personality, right? So it could be their personality that I liked, the way they trade, you know, the, the types of setups they're taking. I would go in, find people, and I would dissect what they were doing. I'm like, okay, he's using power of three, or he's using uh, breakers, or whatever it is. I'd go in and find things that I like, standard deviations, whatever it was, and I would piece it together and kind of make my own little, I would take their golden nuggets, mm -hmm. and I would piece it together in, in my own strategy. And that's kind of how I did it. Um, and I think you can do that, and that can kind of fast track your, your, uh, your journey of finding what resonates with you. Definitely. No, definitely. But the interesting thing you mentioned there is that all that information is there, even other people's charts, etc. they post them on, on X or any social platform, maybe even in communities. Mm -hmm. But the reality is most people aren't trying to do that work of dissecting people's charts or mm -hmm. trying to understand what they're seeing. Instead, they're trying to use it as signals or trying to use it as, uh, oh, he's, he's yeah. long, I'm short. Um, and they're not really looking at the finer details of where they can learn. Because I've met a few traders now where they built their whole strategy just by dissecting other people's charts. No, so not even looking at it or just, you know, you keep watching their charts. No, just dissecting it though. Taking it and understanding why have they got this analysis or why did they take this trade? And it just requires that work. And I think same with like ICT, a lot of people complain about oh, the hours long videos mm -hmm. and the rants and all of this stuff. But the reality is, what is your goal? If your goal is to be a ICT trader or just generally a profitable trader and you resonate with that style, regardless of how long it may take, 
you should be willing to do that work, right? Mm. Um, what is your strategy though? Like how, what, how have you used the concepts to, to work for you and, and to be consistent for you? Take your trading to the next level. With Funded Peaks, we offer the biggest drawdown in the entire industry at 12%. With the max account size of $600,000 and 24-hour payouts, Funded Peaks is the prop you should have started with. Learn from the best, build a track record, and become a real fund manager with optimum trading conditions and 24-7 support. Funded Peaks has the best pricing offers in the industry with challenges from as low as just $50. Join Funded Peaks and get started today. I want to tell you about the best provider of tools for traders, and that is Lux Algo. Lux Algo is the largest provider of free tools on TradingView. You've probably seen them all over TradingView as well for their Smart Money Concepts Indicator, as well as so many other free resources. Now, if you don't know, they have also created exclusive toolkits to take your trading to the next level directly on TradingView. Whether you trade price action, ICT, or you want advanced signals and powerful overlays, they have all the tools necessary for you to grow. All their tools work on every market. So whether you trade Forex, crypto, or stocks, it does not matter. Now, through the podcast, you can get 20% off using the link in the description. So make sure you click that and let's get back to the episode. Yeah, so I look, I mainly look at the daily profile, right? Uh, my trades are anywhere from on the five minute, one minute, all the way up to maybe the hourly, but I'm not swinging, right? I'm not holding stuff overnight. And that's something like an example, I know my trading personality. I don't like going to bed with money on the line, mm -hmm. right? And, and I can't sleep. I can't stop looking at the chart, right? <laughs> so I kind of just get my piece of the pie off the daily expansion and be done for the day. So I'm kind of like a hit it and quit it type of guy, I'll, uh, I'll go in there, get a piece of the move and be done, right? One win and I'm done for the day. So I'm really trying to capture, figure out one, every day is like a puzzle in my mind. Um, I look for the pieces, right? I look at the sessions, I look at the daily highs and lows, I look at the daily top down analysis, all that stuff. But I'm really trying to figure out where that daily candle is going to expand and then just capture a piece of that move. You don't need the whole move to be profitable, just a piece and then I'll be done for the day. And so those small, those small wins, they stack up. And so that's kind of what, one, I post online. I think that's why a lot of people resonate with the content I post, is because I'm not sitting here trying to scalp 20 trades a day. I don't have the patience for that. I'm really just trying to get a trade in, go live the rest of my life, and it's allowed me to come down here on, you know, during the middle of the week and meet you and meet some other people, hopefully, later this trip. So, definitely. yeah. No, definitely. And, you know, in terms of that, though, like, how do you keep yourself from, even if you take, say, take your trade, how do you keep yourself from not going in and taking another, right? Whether it's a loss or a win, mm -hmm. because a lot of people have that as their plan. Their plan is like, if I take a trade and I lose that trade, no problem, done for the day, next day, right? Or they might have two trade rule, for example. Mm -hmm. So they might lose two trades or win one, lose one, whatever it may be. But let's say they have a maximum of two trades in a day they're allowed to take. That's their rule, but yet they don't stick to it, mm -hmm. right? They take the trades in the morning, one or two, one, one, lost one, whatever the scenario, but then they take more and they stay on it or they keep watching it throughout the day and then end up falling into the trap of taking another. Yeah. So how have you managed to stop doing that? So obviously, like you said, most, I don't know about most people, I know what I do. I, um, I have max daily win and loss rules, right? And I have mass, max risk management rules, like the percent I risk, all that stuff, right? So I'm thinking about it like a sharpshooter. I'm not sitting there on the, on the 15 second chart like a machine gun taking a, a bunch of different scalps. Yeah. I have two shots per day and they're in the chamber each morning. And so really, if I get one winner in the morning, because I usually trade 8.30 to 11.30, because I find most of the volatility with the news embargo that's lifted at 8.30, most of the volatility with the 9.30 open, all those things, they happen on in the morning, the New York AM session. And so that's the session that I like to trade. And also it's nice because I can get my setups or my trades in early and then go fuck off and do whatever I want the rest of the day, right? So. I think having those max daily win and loss rules, for me, like I said, I have two trades a day, get one winner, I'm done. If I lose one trade, I have one more in the chamber and I'm risking the same amount. So I'm taking minimum two R trades. If I lose one in the morning, now I'm down negative one R. And if I win another trade the afternoon, well now I'm up two R, sorry, up one R, okay? So negative one and then if I win one, I'm up two. So back to break even and now I'm up one R. Mm -hmm. So, but if I lose two that day, right? Now I'm down 2R, and if I'm risking 1% per trade, that's 2%. So if I lose two in a row, what that tells me is, one, I'm not on my A game, right? Or maybe there's something in the market that I'm not seeing clearly. My bias is off. Whatever it is, I'm off that day. And it's probably best I just step away anyways. 
So that's kind of how I came to formulate my max win and loss rules, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of like a psychological thing. Like maybe I'm not seeing something clearly. I've lost two in a row. If I take any more and lose, I'm probably gonna go on tilt because I know myself. I just need to step away. So. Yeah. No, definitely. And in terms of like stepping away though, is there things that you have in place or other hobbies or other businesses or other work or just family, whatever it may be, is there other mm -hmm. things that you then make sure to do as part of your routine to sort of keep yourself busy or are you okay to, even if the day's free, you're, you know I'm not touching the charts? Yeah, that was a big struggle for me when I went full time because I actually work for a startup. I've, ever, I've never really had like a real corporate nine to five job, mm -hmm. so to speak, what most people call it a nine to five. I haven't really had a corporate nine to five job. You know, I worked jobs in high school, washing golf carts. I worked at a barbecue restaurant before I kind of went full time trading. And I, immediately after that, actually, I worked for a startup um, in Greenville. It was based out of Greenville and we flew to New York. It was a real estate tech startup. And so that gave me a lot of freedom because I work from home to, to do the trading. Right. And so if I was trading in the morning, I kind of could work on the other stuff. But when I went full time, I had all this time on my hands. Right. And it was a big shift because the more work you do in trading, the more you can lose. But when we are growing up and kind of society kind of grooms us to say like, the more you work, the more you make, but trading is like the complete opposite, right? You, you know, you can really harm yourself if you overwork yourself, right? Just staring at the charts, you'll see stuff that's not actually there. You'll force a trade. Um, so yeah, I work on other stuff, but I think the way that I'm able to stick to my rules is one, because I know that my trading career isn't, dependent upon the outcome of a single day, right? I know I have a long ways to go, but if I let it be dependent on one single day, I can blow up my account, right? I can blow up whatever it is I'm working on. So I, I keep that in the back of my mind. I know I have a long career ahead of me, but also, like I said before, the discipline that you build outside of the market is gonna carry itself over into the market. So if you can make your bed every morning, or if you can go to the gym three days a week, five days a week, whatever, whatever you wanna do, if you can have a set schedule like that and also focus on fucking the day and not letting it fuck you, then I think you're going to find it a lot easier to obey your rules and just come out on top in the end. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So like just instilling and building that muscle, that, that discipline muscle, if you will, getting used to, you know, I'd say a big part of it as well is like actually getting to a point where you back up your own words. You know, mm -hmm. So if you say, I'm not going to take another trade. That's a big thing, yeah. Right? And then you, you just completely ignore what you just said. It's like you're, you're telling your mind that it doesn't matter what you say. Don't listen to what you say. You're not going to listen anyway. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Versus when you actually start to really believe in your own words or f at least back up your own words, it's kind of like it's, it's the follow through of that. It's like the, the more you do that, the more you'll continue to do that, mm -hmm. you know? And I think a lot of people find themselves in that position where they will keep saying something, keep saying, oh, I'm going to stick to two trades in a day, or I'm going to stick to this risk or this risk to reward, or I'm going to stick to this strategy. But then if you're just constantly jumping, you're literally just, you're basically telling yourself you're a joke. Yeah, you know? exactly. You're not a man in your word, right? And that's one of my pet peeves, honestly, is where, like <laughs> when someone makes plans with you and they flake, right? That's like, that's, that's one of my pet peeves because one, like you're telling someone that their time's not as valuable as yours, right? And so they plan out and make plans with you and they flake. But I really pride myself on being a man of my word. And I think that is why it's also easy to just kind of stick to what I say. It's like, okay, if I'm only going to take two trades today, that's all I'm going to do. And like you said, if you disobey that, then you're basically telling yourself like whatever, you know, I have no self-discipline. I don't respect myself. You know, I don't have any control over my behavior. And it's really just that downward spiral that you're gonna fall into. If you can constantly do that over and over again, it's gonna hurt your account, it's gonna hurt your mentality. And it's just this negative feedback loop that I think a lot of people will get stuck in. Right? It is, no, 100% it is. And you mentioned in terms of risk and like your R multiple like risk to reward there as well. So you're using like a one to two risk to reward? Yeah, that's my minimum, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then in terms of risk, like how are you someone who uses like a fixed risk or are you someone who uses like a dynamic risk? So, I'm usually risking 1% of my account, right? Or half a percent, depending on the setup or the conditions. But I'm usually trying to take a minimum 2R, right? That's, that's, my, that's my minimum. So if there's like some structure, some equal highs or whatever I'm aiming for, right? That might be like a three or a four, I'm still gonna take parcels off at two, mm -hmm. no matter what. And like I'll post trades sometimes and people are like, why are you taking profits in a discount? And I'm aiming for premium or highs. 
I'm like, dude, I'm just following my rules. Like, yeah. you do you, I'm gonna do me. Um, I saw you post something. I think it was was it yesterday, day before. A huge sell, like you taking a partial or close the trade, and then there's that huge sell off. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I missed like that gigantic sell off right before 10 a.m. news. Like, was that Friday? I, I think, think it was so, Friday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, I did post that. And like that kind of stuff used to affect me in the beginning. Cause you're like, oh my God, I, I missed out on all this profit. And I had three contracts. I could have let one ride. But like I said, I'm not trying to sit there for the whole day and trade and scalp. And I could have left a runner. Yeah. Hindsight 2020, but I'm just trying to get a piece every single day and kind of be like a bricklayer, right? Show up like a bricklayer, brick by brick, build the house. And by the end of it, hopefully you'll have a mansion, right? So that's kind of like my, always been my mentality. Just getting a piece. You don't have to get the big, big moves. Those do come every once in a while, but if you're always trying to hit home runs, you're going to strike out a lot. So if you look at baseball, like the best Hall of Famers, you know, they're probably batting like 300, maybe 400, and they're in the Hall of Fame, right? Mm -hmm. So I could be wrong on that, but that, that's the analogy, right? You don't have to be hitting every single trade and you don't have to be hitting home runs mm -hmm. to get in. It's always about getting on base and kind of letting those base hits that's it. Yeah. Well, there's no, the way I've always described it is like, there's no truly undefeated person, right? It's like the person mm -hmm. who wins the F1 racing. I don't, I'm not obviously uh, big into F1, but like they don't win every single race. Mm -mm. Yeah, they still win the overall championship, for example, or same with, uh, even in WWE, you know, <laughs> even in WWE, yeah, yeah. It's, even though it's scripted and fake, like no one just wins all the time that like, mm -mm. they, they lose in the UFC, same thing that people lose, mm -hmm. but yet they can still become champion. Um, even Floyd Mayweather lost probably in the amateurs before yeah. he was on this professional record, for example. Yeah, everyone has to face defeat, feel defeat. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, I think in trading, unfortunately, a lot of people just assume you need to be the very, very best. You need the flawless record, right? And, you, and with that, like we were talking about, try and squeeze every pip and point out of the markets. Yeah. Um, and it just doesn't make sense. It's like, if you be real with yourself, is that realistic? Is yeah. that something that is feasible for you to do? You know, and I get in terms of chasing perfection or trying to not chasing perfection, but trying to be the best mm -hmm. you can possibly be and to operate the best traders you possibly be. I get that. But perfection is a dangerous area. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people what happens is they see the perfectionist kind of vibe on social media. It looks like everyone's killing it. Mm -hmm. Everyone's winning. And I'm guilty of this, too. Right. I, I don't really post losers anymore. Um, but you see everyone on there killing it. And maybe you didn't win, make money that day or someone else did. And you're just kind of like, that'll force you to strategy hop, which you got to watch out for. But it looks like everyone's killing it. And so that that's becomes like the expectation I think a lot of people have when they come into trading. But that can't be further from the truth, right? So you really need to kind of look at the content online with that in mind. You yeah. know, so that, that was like a big thing for me. I think a lot of people see that and they struggle early on. But once you're around long enough, you know, everyone has losers, right? hundred percent. So. No, hundred percent. And you know, one thing that I think is a very good topic at the moment is in terms of like capital wise, like what was your journey in terms of capital? Yeah. Were you someone who just like put in your own capital or were you someone who went like mm -hmm. investor route or, or prop firm route or what was your yeah, yeah. capital journey? If you will? So I trade personal account right now and that's kind of always what I've been trading, right? With options or whatever it is. And so I kind of grew it with some options trades, but I got that money, right? I worked jobs and stuff like that in the past. But I got the money really, and I'm not gonna sit here and tell you like I got it out the mud. You know, I, I, this is just authentic to me. I came from a middle class family. My parents are still together. They've always supported me in everything I do. And they probably, when I told them that what I wanted to do trading wise, they probably looked at me and was, you know, looked at each other and were like, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So um, I had some money set aside for education, college really. And that was another big factor of kind of why I wanted to move back home, save some money, go in state. And because I knew the money I had left over from that education account, whatever it was, I could have depleted it all if I stayed out of state. I knew the money that was left over was going to be mine afterwards. And so when I went back and got out of, out of college, that was like, OK, I'm going to take a risk here and I'm going to take that money that's, you know, was for my education. And I'm going to I'm going to sit here and see what I can do with it. And so that was kind of how I got my start. And that's kind of how I've been able to grow in my account was the money from that education account. That my parents had for me really yeah did they know you were taking it for trading yeah yeah well i told them yeah they knew they knew that afterwards like they know i'm not irresponsible right okay. um financial literacy has always been kind of something that's been in my family and so i'm very blessed to have you know great parents right but i think they they knew what i was doing 
Now, were they on board with it? Like, were they telling me they were? Yeah. But in their minds, I don't know, right? That's a question for them. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I'll have them on the show one time and we can you have a sit definitely, down. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. That would actually be interesting. Like the, Bring the traders and the parents. Trader, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, getting their real thoughts. You know, I bet it'd be hilarious to, yeah. to see like the true reaction. But no, the, it's good. Well, I would say like, you know, props to you because obviously a lot of people try and hide those sort of things for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, I'm not going to sit here and told you, you know, I got it out in the mud and traded a thousand to a hundred thousand account, right? Mm -hmm. Like I had some money left over. I played the cards I was dealt and I made a calculated risk. And so that's that, right? Well, you could have easily ended up in the mud. If you I could have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, but I think is like, that's the biggest thing. And that's kind of why I felt so one confident in my abilities that I know at the end of the day, if I had lost this money, was it the end of the world? No, because I still had my parents I could go live with. Right. I still had dental school on the back burner. So I knew I had these backup things, but I thought to myself, at the time in my 20s, younger 20s, it's like, I'm young. I have the freedom to do and take the risk. I don't have any kids. I don't have a wife or girlfriend, whatever. I can move to any city I want. I'm going to go somewhere that's sunny, be in a nice environment, and I'm going to sit here and see if I can make this work. And so I took those calculated risks. And looking back now, I'm, I'm very glad that I did, right? Because they paid off and I'm, here I am sitting with you, right? So that is something that I think a lot of young people should look at. And if you're, gonna, if you're thinking about trying it out, Definitely do it, right? But I think what a lot of people do is they come to the market and they come in and they, they the market's gonna solve all their problems. And they're trading from almost a scarcity mindset. And that's like the worst thing you can do because it's gonna force you to one, depend on the market to have, you know, basically to eat, right? And if you have are down to your last few dollars and you're trading your last few dollars, man, that's like the worst spot to be. 100%. That's the worst spot. 100%, I don't understand like the mentality that people, well, I guess I do understand. You know where they're coming from. Yeah. yeah. I understand what they're trying to do, but I don't understand when it comes to trading that everyone knows is that that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. right? I understand the opportunities there. It's the same opportunity as going to the lottery or going to the casino, mm -hmm. right? That you could win. But the difference with trading is obviously you have the edges there. So that when you have that edge, you can be profitable. But at the end of the day, your psychology is going to be completely haywire if you are, as you say, desperation. Mm -hmm. If you have that desperation for money and that scarcity and you don't have a lot of money, whether it's, you know, a lot of people are trading from debt, like they don't have savings and they don't have the income really, but they're putting any last penny or using loans or even credit cards to trade mm -hmm. in the hope that they will change at something. And regardless of whether you have a good strategy or good edge, the reality of you sticking to that when you're in that position is extremely slim. And I say that because I was that person. Mm -hmm. I was that person. I was that person who had no savings and I would use credit cards to like try and put two, 300 pound into an account and try and flip it. And this never worked. Yeah. And it just got, the hole just got bigger and therefore the emotions just got even wider in terms of the, the polarizing swing of uh, positive mm -hmm. and, ne and negative. And um, every time I would then trade, I would literally try and just, I'll be, I'll be oh, I'm clear, I'm just gonna focus on now. But then as soon as you start to win some trades, you're thinking about, okay, I'm finally going to make this 30K that I put into trading yeah. you know, over like 50, 60 different accounts in small sums. Uh, I'm finally going to make it all back and then be able to change my life. And then, but that mentality just doesn't work. You mm -hmm. know, and I, based on all the people I've spoken to so far, and I really do, there's, there's a few uh, sort of enigmas, like I said, like a few people where they've maybe traded from that position and it's worked out for them. Yeah. But the reality is most people have either had some form of good income whether it's from a business, from their job, um, normally from those two things, or they have good savings, mm -hmm. or they did it slowly, like going full time and then get and sort of scaling their trading it was a slow process. The, that's the reality of the majority of people. And I think a lot of people, I don't even know if it's social media. I like a lot of, we always like to kind of poke at social media, especially in the trading industry, but I don't even know if it's social media because it just seems like common sense. Like if, and I get it, the opportunities there. All I did, what I had to do and what I would recommend everyone else do, and it would be good to get your thoughts on it, is like, if you are in that position, mm -hmm. what would be the best thing to do? Like, what I did was I just spent time learning and saving. Exactly. But you didn't quit your job right away either, right? You, no, you were working, yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest things you can do is, one, like I've seen it firsthand, people try and quit their jobs. Or no, they, they do quit their jobs yeah. to, to focus solely on trading. But it's like, you can do both, right? Especially, and that's why I like ICT so much, you can do both. Because there's certain time windows of the day where setups are high likely to form. So if you can frame it in that way, then you can look for, you can kind of section off your day, right? Like I'm going to trade from this hour to this hour. And after that, I'm done, right? And then work on some other stuff.
So I think like you did it the right way because if you don't have that income coming in, then you're really going to be dependent on the outcome of your trades. And that's like the opposite way for trading. You want to be disconnected almost from like the outcome of your trades. Ideally, right? You want to be like a robot. And so if you're emotionally invested in the outcome of those trades and you need that money to eat, to send your kids to school, whatever it is, that's the most dangerous place to be. Definitely. No, it really is. And, you know, in terms of uh, capital that you're trading with now, like, have you sort of shared how much you're trading with at the moment? Or? Not really. I like to keep it kind of private, but it's multiple six figures. Amazing. No, absolutely yeah. amazing. And the reason I ask that, though, is you've gone from, you know, you're scaling, right? And I think it's so important to talk about because, especially because of prop firms and these funding mm -hmm. companies, a lot of people kind of haven't gone through that process anymore mm -hmm. of actually going through the scaling process with capital. And trading like with your own money, right? And trading with your yeah. own money, of course. Yeah, no, 100%. But even then, like, like the, the own money aspect is a huge thing. Like there's mm -hmm. like here, uh, psychology wise and risk wise. And then the funding firms like down there. Mm -hmm. But even then, a lot of people will skip the process there where they instead of going, let's say, 10K account, 25K account, 50K mm -hmm. account and scaling through that, they just 200. What, what's the biggest account they offer? Let's just yeah. go straight there. 500K um, right now. Yeah. And then alongside <laughs> that, we mix in what we were literally just talking about in mm -hmm. terms of like they're doing that with money they probably can't afford to lose. Uh, yeah. where they don't have savings as well. And then suddenly now they're on this 500K account, 300K account, and they're risking a 300K, uh, 300K, 3K uh, a trade, even though it's not real, their psychology is all over the place. Yeah. Right? So what's it been like to obviously actually, well, one, trade your own capital, and then two, scale that capital? You know, so as you, is there any pivotal lessons or hurdles you had to overcome to get used to certain contract sizes or risk amounts or profits amounts? Mm -hmm. I was definitely in the situation where I jumped into live funds way too early. I think most people are. And, you know, I had, I was trading options with live money and I, 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 I kind of got past that like scaling phase in, in the options world. Right. But when I hit futures, that's kind of when I started taking on more size and scaling up. So like, I'll say if you're coming into the market, there's definitely a certain process you should go. It should really be like studying, right? And not even taking trades, pushing the button on a demo account. It's just be studying and watching price action live. And this is something that I tell um, a lot of people online. If they ask me, like, hey, man, how, do I, how should I approach studying all the content? And I always say, like, well, one, find what resonates with you. And just watch price live as, as much as you can, right? You can, back testing can only take you so far. So you need to watch price live to really get and see how the candles paint on the chart. And so once you've done that, right? Then you can move into, okay, I'm taking mental trades now on the charts because I know where I'm gonna get in. I know where my mental stop's gonna be and my mental take profit and just kind of taking mental trades, right? And once you can kind of feel comfortable calling the moves before they happen and it gets boring to you, because in the, in the beginning, you're gonna be like, wow, this is awesome. Like it's to the tick, right? To the tick, to the pip. Once you can kind of get past that and move into, okay, this is boring now. This is just expected, right? It's playing out to a T as expected. That's when you can go into pushing a button with a demo account pushing a button on maybe small leverage live account, but you need to prove consistency in the beginning. And that's something that I didn't do early on, right? So learn from my mistakes. And then once you can do that, that's when, you, like you said, you go in and you can go on like a 10K prop firm challenge, 25K. Don't go for the big boy, because they're gonna stack, right? You can stack them, but go for the small challenges first. As little risk as possible. And then once you can kind of prove yourself, you know, I've. Because there's only certain things that you can experience with live money on the line, right? You know, this is live now. This is real money. This isn't demo. So once you can kind of get past that and you kind of find and self-analyze what your internal issues are, that's a big thing I love trading is because it really forces you to self-analyze who you are as a person, where your faults are, because the market's going to expose where those faults are in your personality, and it's going to attack those. So if you can't self-analyze and take responsibility for your actions as a trader, it's really going to expose that. And if you either adapt, you can succeed, but if you don't, you're gonna die, right? And it's gonna take what you have in every single penny. So that's why I love trading, but definitely go in that route, right? You need to start by learning mental trades, watching Price Live, make sure it's boring. Then you move into the demo account, pushing the buttons and actually executing. And once you feel comfortable with that and you prove to yourself, it's just like the, the dental school thing. I proved to myself that I could get a good score on this test. I just put my mind to it. Same thing with a demo account. Prove to yourself that you know what you're doing. 
then you know, right? And now the only difference is you're doing it with fake money versus live money. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's the big hurdle I think people need to, to get into their minds. Like who cares if you're trading with a demo account? Learn the concepts, prove consistency. Then all you're doing is transferring it over your approach to live money. So what do you think in terms of um, people saying like, okay, stick to a plan. They always say like, how many trades is enough? 10 trades, mm -hmm. 20 trades. Uh, is it the same principle though, like you're saying, in terms of like prove to yourself you can stick to a plan for 100 trades. The lowest prices in the entire industry with challenges from just $35 and payouts in as little as five days. The expert challenge is finally here. Get funded up to $100,000 at skilled funded traders. With unlimited trading days and 85% profit split, the expert challenge changes the game. Click the link below to get started today. Or what, however many, right? I know we'll a lot actually of, do it. Yeah, I know a lot of people say like a good sample size is 100 trades. And so I think you should have at least a few months of demo executions under your belt before you come in and start trading live funds, right? And I know that you might be saying, like people watching are like, yeah, I haven't been through a full market cycle yet, right? But if you really wanna get down and, and, and dirty, get your hands dirty and kind of find out about yourself, you need to kind of, you need to kind of get your hands wet in the live funds sort of thing as soon as possible. But that doesn't mean you rush the process. Right. Mm -hmm. So that way you can find things about yourself that you need to fix and self analyze. So, I mean, I can't tell you if, if looking back now, if I feel like if you're not looking back at your progress, cause a lot of people that compare themselves to others, but like the best thing to do is just look back at how far you've come so far, because I, can, I, I cringe at the guy I used to be <laughs> three or four years ago. Right. And so if you're not looking back and cringing at the person you used to be, then you probably haven't grown that much. And so that's a good indicator of, wow, like look how far I've came, you know, it's, it's a crazy feeling. And so if you can just become 1% better each day, then like you're going to get to that level that you want to be. Definitely. In terms of that level then, so for yourself, like what is your goal with trading? Like where is it you want to take it? Is it something you see like yourself doing for the rest of your life? Yeah. I mean, it's a lifelong skill, right? And so I think trading a lot of people, what, what happens is they let a lot people online or just people in general box them in to, oh, you're a trader, like, why are you doing all this other stuff? And it's like, trading is only a small part of who I am, right? But I will say it's been a big factor in me leveling up as a person because of that self-analyzation and this, that personal growth, right? So I think long-term, I like to travel. And so that's one of the reasons I kind of gravitated towards trading because of the freedom, the time, location, financial freedom, all that stuff. But really for me, it was kind of like the time and the location stuff. Money is just a tool that allows you to do those things. And so it's easy to get caught up in all the materialistic stuff, especially if you live here in Miami, you see everyone. I, I saw like eight Uruses in like 12, <laughs> in like 12 <laughs> hours from my hotel room. I was doing some work. I was like, I hear the engine. I look out. I'm like, damn. So yeah. like, I think it's easy to get caught up in all the material stuff. But at the end of the day, all that stuff basically ends up owning you. And so my goals for this year is one, to kind of travel a lot more. Because I'll be honest, I did some reflecting this past new year and I felt like I was a slave to the charts and I really wasn't taking advantage of all the work I'd been putting in. And so I, I didn't have any balance when I was learning. I was locked in. I wasn't going out. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't partying really. And there's some times I'd go out and take a break, right? And try and balance it. But there really wasn't a lot of balance in my journey early on. And I think that's how I was able to kind of find success so quickly right? But it takes a toll. And so at some point when you get to the point where you're, you can kind of step back and relax, that's kind of how I feel I'm, where I'm at now. I've put in all this work and now I kind of want to enjoy the fruits of my labor. And so that is something I want to do this year is one, use that time and use, use all the things I've worked for to network, right? And kind of travel around. And so like Miami, my first time here, it's awesome. I want to, I want to come back already. I leave on Saturday in a few days, but networking is a big thing I want to do this year. It's been one of my goals for 2024 traveling. I went to Italy with my parents. Um, we went to, we were there for two weeks, I think kind of just traveling Northern Italy. And that was a big eye opener for me because I had been to other countries, right? But it was always like a second world country or like a third world country. This is my first time in a first world country, you know, across the pond. Mm -hmm. So I know you live in the UK, right? That's a place I want to go. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll come see you in the UK or something. 100%. We'll, yeah. do a, we'll make sure to do a part two there for sure. Um, one thing I was going to ask you in terms of the, 
personal account, obviously trading your own capital. Mm -hmm. How do you go about growing the account versus and withdrawing from the account? Like, do you live off your trading account as well? Yeah, I make withdrawals here and there. Um, the thing is, the way the, the what allows me to do what I do full time is living below my means, right? I know I can go out and buy, you know, crazy, maybe some crazy stuff, but the fact that I'm able to one, I know almost down to the couple hundred bucks, what it costs for me each month to live. That was like the biggest thing. And like financial literacy, like I said, has always been something that was preached in my family early on. And it's not really something that's taught in school, which sucks, but knowing down to almost like a couple hundred dollars, like what it is that it takes to live for me to month, month, basic needs like rent, food, you know, having some fun money, stuff like that. And then really just kind of limiting my expenses. That was something and living below my means, that was something that I'd say helped me kind of get past the lifestyle creep, if you know what I mean. Like a lot of people they make all this money and they all of a sudden start upgrading their lifestyle, right? Living below your means like that is going to allow you to really have that pressure taken off. And so I, I make withdrawals here and there, and that, that is really just to pay basic expenses. But other than that, like I'm, my full focus is compounding that. And then also some side stuff too. Definitely, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. And you know, in terms of uh, your trades though, I wanted to ask you, I've never asked anyone before, I don't think, but I wanted to ask you, and maybe this can be a new theme, who knows? But like, what has been one of the most memorable wins that you've ever had? Honestly, like when you bottom tick a turtle soup trade or like a top tick a trade, like those are just the best, like better than sex, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That, that just, just those types of trades are the best, right? And I mean, there's, there's no, nothing really beats that because you're, everyone's like, oh, you don't need the whole move to be profitable, right? But when you do get that kind of like almost to the tick, you capture like the, the bulk of the move you're looking for. It's like the best feeling. So like, I'd say those types of trades, there's no real... Like I said, I'm a base hit guy. Yeah. And so I'm really not holding for home runs, but like... Have you ever had a trade that really just like, in terms of monetary value, that really just stood out to you? Maybe even if it was like earlier in your journey and it was just yeah. like, whoa, that was a lot of money. I think end of last year, my biggest trade was 13,000 in a day. And I had like five contracts of NASDAQ and it was almost like a turtle soup style trade. I didn't catch the very bottom, right? But I was in the wicks. And uh, quick note, if you're an ICT trader, Think about, and I heard this from Kyle actually, he's like, this changed the game for me. I kind of realized that all I was trying to do as a trader was place myself in those higher time frame wicks, right? And so if you can kind of frame your trades like that, then it becomes a lot easier to maybe get those style turtle, turtle soup trades or those wick style trades, right? Okay. But like that, I guess monetary value, like that's the biggest trade, right? But like those, those aren't what define you as a trader. It's really like how you handle the losses and how you can kind of come back from those. That's what really defines you. Well, that was my next one, which was yeah. is there like a notable standout loss that really maybe hurt at the time, but taught you a valuable lesson? Shoot, not one loss. Try like, like I said, I jumped into live funds too early. <laughs> Try, I, th I thought I was the man. Like I thought I had all figured out ICT beginner shit and I hopped in with live funds, not with a you know, full size obviously, but kind of just to try it out. And I made like 23% my first couple months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, this is like, this is pretty easy. <laughs> Let me just kind of up the size. And then I started taking losses, right? I think we were just in consolidation on a higher time frame, And I was used to trading those reversals. And then we started trending and I couldn't adapt. I didn't know how to trade, you know, continuation. And I just started taking paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, trying to call tops and bottoms. And those paper cuts added up and I had basically lost all my gains over those series of paper cuts and my confidence was at all time low. And I, I took a step back when I had lost it all back to break even drawdown. And I said, you know what, whatever I'm doing is not working. I need to take a step back and figure it out what it is I'm doing wrong. And so that's when I got big into journaling. And that's kind of when I started getting big into using trade Zella shout out Umar Ashraf, if you're watching. Um, but it's a great platform. I started getting big on journaling and, not really just keeping track of like the monetary, like the stats, but really like my emotions. Like what is it in the charts that I'm doing wrong? How am I feeling? Cause my confidence, it was at an all time low. And like, I kind of had to take a step back and say, how am I gonna get past this? I can either just keep doing what I'm doing and lose it all, or I can make a change. And that's when 
you know what? I took a step back. I humbled myself. I went back to demo and I said, all right, I'm gonna I'm prove consistency in demo this time before I move back in. Cause I'll be honest, like my confidence was, like I said, all time low. And I was starting to doubt the plan, right? I, I was like, is this trading thing really for me? And I think we've all been in those situations, right? I'm sure you have, especially with your story. So I think doing that, doing those steps like I talked about, going with watching Price Live, then moving to demo and proving consistency, then live, live funds, that's the route you need to take. And that's kind of the, the route that I neglected early on. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm, I've been trading options. Like I wanna be paid for my time. Like this is dumb, I'm not trading demo. <laughs> and I had to get past and, and suppress that ego. And that's when I started to see results, right? So, and what would you say in terms of uh, being ICT trader, right? Like, what would you say that ICT traders are getting wrong? I think not finding one, trying to implement every single little thing. It's just going to lead to analysis paralysis. And honestly, find what resonates with you. Like that's always been kind of my motto this year is even me, like I was trying to implement everything. And I was stuck in this loop of like watching every single video and, you know, implementing every single little thing I saw, like new opening gaps, you know, Reaper FEG, like all these different things. If you can kind of just step back, right? Pick and choose and be very selective on what you like. Dissect other people's stuff. Take little pieces of their strategy. If you like that, implement it, right? And test it. Make sure it works with all the other things. And once you've done that of numerous times, you pretty much have a working model and all you need to do is just focus on that because an edge is really just something that repeats more often than not in the market. And the cool thing about trading is you can take skewed risk reward setups. And you don't even have to be right 50% of the time. You can be right 33%, 25%, whatever it is, and you can still make money. And so that's what I think a lot of people are doing wrong is they're not going through and asking themselves, one, what type of trader do they want to be, right? What matches my personality? You have to go through that self-reflection to find that out. Figure out what works for you, resonate what resonates with you, and really just implement those little things that work well together and that match you. Definitely. And if you were to give one lesson, like if you were to look at your journey as a trader or your knowledge so far, and you say, okay, this is one very vital lesson mm -hmm. that has helped me or yourself, for example, and you wanted to share with everyone out there, what would that be? I'd say, and this is kind of like where I want to take the, the, my YouTube channel, right? Is life outside the market is going to carry itself over into the market. So if you don't have your finances in order outside the market, if you don't have the discipline already built into your routine outside the market, then what makes you think that it's going to be any different inside the charts? And so that's why I love trading so much because it's that forced level up, right? That forced self discovery. And if you can go through that process and build kind of like the life you want outside of the charts, right? And you might not be able to like do what you want and travel and drive the car you want, but if you can build the habits and think about the person, right, that you want to become, what kind of habits do they have? What do they do each day? How do they dress? How do they talk? How do they act? Become that person and build that discipline into your life. And you're going to see your trading transform like it, like it did for me. Definitely. No, definitely. And hopefully people can take that on board because mm -hmm. I know people say it or they hear it a lot, but they, they need to take action because at the end of the day, you know, it just stays words, right? It just stays. You can watch all the content all day long, mm -hmm. watch a YouTube channel, watch a podcast, watch whatever. But why are you watching it? That's, I think, a very important question that people should ask themselves. Is like, why are you watching it just to watch it for the sake of watching it, to say that you've watched it mm -hmm. or that you're actually trying to learn from it, you know, yeah. actually do something of value from it. But you mentioned journaling a moment ago, and I wanted to ask you as well, like, you know, a lot of tra traders are thankfully using TradeZilla now, or at least they are journaling hopefully now, but they don't have the excuse they used to have of like, it's so hard to do. Yeah. Right? Cause now you have these, the platform like TradeZilla, for example, but what in particular about journaling do you look at in terms of data? So let's say TradeZilla, is there any particular data when you go on there that you go, okay, I like, you know, looking at this has really helped me. Like mm -hmm. either looking into more detail on these particular aspects or data that is given from TradeZilla has really helped me to excel as a trader. Honestly, the days of the week, like that's the first thing that pops in my mind. Like Mondays were my worst days. And so I almost opted to eliminate those days. At least in the beginning I did don't trade Mondays. So I'm taking a three day weekend, which is nice. Yep. But the, the days of the week are the best thing ever because like, you know, if you're trading like power three, for example, on a weekly candle, like Monday might be your accumulation day. And if you got high impact newsletter that week, Monday could also be kind of choppy. Right? So 
I think the days of the week, um, average hold time, right, for me, I know that I do better on quicker scalps, more day trade style stuff versus, you know, trying to swing or trying to hold for the whole entire daily move because of what happens a lot of times for me at least on those days, price will come back and stop me out for break even and then go. So like that was something, just looking at that data is going to tell you, okay, maybe I should stop doing this, right? But that data can only tell you so much. Like you still have to analyze and kind of pair it up with like your habits in the charts. And that's where actually marking up your charts, looking back, the setups you take, writing down like your game plan, Hannah has a game plan feature in there, using tags, things like that. That's like the biggest thing. So well, data can only tell you so much. You kind of have to, like I said, pair it with the types of trades you're taking. No, 100%. And we're going to come towards the end of the podcast here. And one thing I've been asking some recent guests to do, something a little bit out there, a bit different. Mm. But if you can look down your camera, which is just over here, and you give the traders out there 30 to 60 seconds of your best trading motivation, guidance, tips, yeah. tricks for them to progress and take action on. You know what? I'd say if you're looking to get into trading or you're in trading and you're struggling, do what I've, what I've said today. All right. Find the things that resonate with you. It doesn't have to be ICT, but it can be support and resistance. It can be supply and demand, right? I'm not really a part of the ICT cult. I was in the beginning. I think everyone kind of was, but find what works for you. Stop looking at what's on social media because you got to remember social media is only the highlights. You need to focus on what resonates with you as a trader identify what trader you want to be and then work backwards from there, right? What does he look like? What does he dress like? How does he act? How, what are his habits in the charts? And if you are wanting some more style of this motivation, like look up Jim Ron. He's been someone that I love watching, right? And he has, he's a motivational speaker. Look up Jim Ron. And if you can go back on YouTube after this video, after you watch, you know, 10 more videos of his stuff, go look up Jim Ron and look at his content. All right. It's gonna motivate you. It's not just trading advice, but it's just life advice because trading is a way of life and it's not really something that you can kind of disconnect from. Like you're either a trader or you're not, okay? So go look up Jim Ron and remember, find that picture of the person you wanna become, the trader you wanna become, and then work backwards from there. Find the steps because a goal without steps is just a dream. So you really have to formulate a plan to where you wanna be. Definitely, definitely, I love that. And uh, before we do go, I just, I. Remember when you mentioned ICT there, we didn't talk too much about it, mm -hmm. which is uh, probably a good thing because I'm getting a lot of comments recently like, you're just getting ICT people on all the time. And I'm like, yeah, don't blame me. Like, what do you, what do you want me to do? Yeah, um, it is the hot. It is like the hot topic, I guess. It is. Well, I think at the end of the day, he's had such a huge impact on traders because that's why so many people are using his concepts that he's taught, uh, which is incredible to see. Um, but what I was going to ask you in terms of obviously fair value God, fair value gaps, right? What yeah. insights can you give to traders in terms of fair value gaps? Like what can they, mm. how can they utilize them? Is there anything in particular as someone who uses them yourself? Is there anything in particular that you can, any tips, tricks, anything like that? that oh yeah, for sure. Them? I guess I can't be the fair value guy without having some tips, right? Yes. <laughs> um, so we all know fair value gaps, the true support and resistance in the market, if you want to call it that. And really the biggest thing for me was the way they can invert, right? And they can be used support term resistance. So the biggest thing I'd say is if you're looking to find a high probability fair value gap and one that can invert, look for one that's already been respected previously, right? So it's been formed, price comes up into it and respects it and goes lower. Then if we come back up and disrespect that and close above it, the fact that it was respected before previously on the way down means it's likely to be respected back on the way up. So that's something that I think you should look at, especially if you're trading for value gaps. Interesting. That's it. I love that now. Yeah. That's it. Everyone's taking that signal. Yeah. Take the signal. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure. I was about to yeah. say, call your fair value God to your face then. But Zach, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, either one, man. I, I get it now. But I'm terrible. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to move, like I said, for the, not away from the name. It's going to be my username. But I, I'm kind of trying to put my face out there more and kind of just be known I think it's as good, a person for I who I am. You're a great versus, speaker. Yeah. And I think uh, you articulate, uh, articulate yourself. I, I can't do it right now. <laughs> but you can articulate yeah. uh, yourself so well. And um, I think it's, it's needed in the industry. You know, you need people who... Uh, have gone through the journey and can spread awareness and knowledge and not just in terms of trading but also life advice as well which you have done very well today as well and i hope a lot of people have taken you know notes and, and taken a lot from this which i'm sure they have um but like what, what have you got planned have you got anything planned you know in terms of content any anything different mm -hmm. or anything in particular coming 
Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to take YouTube serious. I might hit you up for some tips. Um, Anytime. Really just to kind of document, one, my journey, which I think Twitter, Twitter's kind of filled with like a bunch of technical stuff. I kind of want to show maybe just elements of my life on YouTube and just kind of have like real conversations like we're having now. Not really in a podcast style, but more of me just like sitting down, talking in front of the camera and just having the real authentic connection with whoever wants to listen. Like that's, that's my goal for 2024. And you can go to my channel, it's just for Value God, and search it up. And I already have a couple of videos on there um, with that kind of style. But that's kind of where I want to take it. Because I know a lot of people enjoy that type of content. And it's kind of different from all the edited stuff you see online nowadays, right? So I think just having a real conversation like that is what's needed in the industry. And just something that a lot of people can connect with. Definitely. No, I love that. And I, I think that that is the things that is needed, you know, just real genuine mm -hmm. conversations and talk. Um, cause obviously we've already had the era of, you know, the lifestyle marketing, if you will, you know, and the, the unrealistic expectation of what I trading think, is. I think that stuff's on the way out. Like it was cool in 2010 maybe, but here we are a decade later. And I think the, the authenticity and just like the real content, like just the, just the authentic vibes, that's what's going to take people. That's what's going to get people well known and just being who you are, right? The fig it till you make it stuff, it's cheesy, it's on the way out. And like, that's why I said yes to you so much. Like instantly I was like, yeah, I'm coming on the podcast when you I asked me, it. because I definitely love what you're doing in the industry, not just with this podcast, but what you got coming up with Riz Burgundy. And <laughs> we're just making it fun. Like I think, I think when Michael came into the industry, it kind of, he definitely was stirring the pot just to get the ICT trend started. Yeah. But I think now that he's kind of chilled out, like it's, it's gonna be fun to see what comes of that. And I think you're doing something that is much needed, right? Just bringing some fun back into the content side of things. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that was the aim. That's the aim and hopefully we can continue mm -hmm. to do it. And we'll have, you'll have to sit with Riz Burgundy sooner. I know, I gotta meet that guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have, obviously, Zach, aka Fair Value God on the podcast. Make sure you check his links out in the description below. The uh, Some playlists, some other recommended episodes will come up on screen, no doubt. Make sure you hit subscribe. And until next time, everyone, take care.